Beyond a Galilee. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, well, okay. Yeah. A resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to Ayan Oshkosh. Cheryl Hens here, Dan Rylands has the night off, and uh, we're, we're joined now by um, someone who is very familiar to you all, uh, Alex Hummel, uh, but he's not here um, with the Oshkosh Northwestern. He is uh, here in his new capacity, and let me get this right, mm -hmm. you are the Community Outreach and Education Coordinator with the Christine Ann Center. That's right. All right, well thanks very much for being here. Thanks for having me we, back. We like it when you're here, no matter what capacity you're coming <laughs> Thank you. in. So anyway, um, for those who don't know, you did mm -hmm. leave the Northwestern yeah. earlier this year, yep. and um, so now that you're in a whole different line of work. Uh, what, what's mm -hmm. it been like for you making that change? It's been amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've, a, a, as a journalist in a, a community the size of Oshkosh, you get to learn a lot about organizations and people and causes. And um, I can honestly say, as a journalist, you know, uh, the Christine and Domestic Abuse Services was one organization we always turned to and relied on to help us tell the full story and get a better perspective on what it what was really happening when you had an instance of domestic violence or abuse in the community. And um, I long admired that, you know, that perspective. It's a very brave one. And uh, the work they do is incredibly important to the community. So um, uh, this earlier this year, I um, uh, saw a job available and decided, you know what, uh, it'd be nice to make a change in my career and in my life a little bit. And uh, like I said, long admired the organization and decided that maybe there's some, some skills I can bring to them. Um, and, and, uh, help advance their mission in the community and so far it's it's been really rewarding rewarding for me and um, I hope rewarding for the organization too well you're you know you're still making a difference in people's lives just in another capacity yeah that's how I tell it, that's how I explain to the people you know um, the work of a newspaper is incredibly important um, and uh, you know what newspapers are going through right now it's a very difficult time for them but um, for everybody we we need our newspapers yeah. uh, they are they are important c community voices they are our voices and when they go away, our voice goes away a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but I, I felt like um, I wanted to challenge myself in a new way. And like you said, Cheryl, make a difference in a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've long looked at domestic abuse and domestic violence as a community issue. It this is. is not a woman's issue. This is not a man's issue. This is not a um, that issue, their issue, this part of town's issue. Mm -hmm. This is a community issue. And I think there's things we all can do as citizens, as supporters, as family members, friends, neighborhoods, mm -hmm. to um, to really uh, better address it. And uh, that's what I hope to help uh, the organ bring to the organization. Sure. Well, we're going to bring some of those very issues um, to, to the viewers tonight. Um, one of the things, I mean, obviously, I think we all know, for the most part, what Christine Ann uh, is and um, you know we're aware we're aware of its main function, um, and, and that is of course to provide shelter to right. to those who need it, mostly women, but mm -hmm. there are some men mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, when it, you know when it, when a man comes to our door and says uh, I need help, I need assistance, you know we don't just say sorry, uh, no guys allowed. Uh, that's not right. at all part of the mission. Um, right. What we do is you know there's, there's there's a great partnership and collaboration in this community between a lot of support agencies, <laughs> and you know we will offer the services we can. We need to refer to other shelter. We'll do that. Um, the point is, we need to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. Make sure they are safe, feel safe, um, get that power back for them. And um, you know, we're not going to turn uh, turn away sure. just because it's a man. Sure. So. And and you mentioned the word power, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's kind of an interesting word when you're talking about domestic abuse yeah. because that's kind of what it's all that's about. What it's all about. But it's it's about getting the person, the victim some power back. It's right. getting them shelter first and foremost, then it's getting them back on their feet. And part of that is through a real interesting program that you first um, started 
well, I first learned about it a couple yeah. of weeks ago when yeah. you came and made a presentation at, at our church, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's the POWER program. Right. Um, so why don't you tell us a little sure. bit, Alex, about what the POWER program is and how it works? It's called Project POWER, and it's a uh, pretty innovative, in fact, probably nationally innovative program between Advocap Incorporated and Christine Ann Domestic Abuse Services and some other partners. And um, what it's really about is uh, recognizing that, you know, after emergency shelter at Christine Ann, um, that is only the beginning of a journey for a survivor of domestic violence or abuse. I mean, that's, that's the first step. What comes after that? And, you know, through uh, support from churches in the community, other uh, funders in the community, they have zoomed in on this program, Project Power, and um, really supported what is ultimately the continuation of that journey. Um, helping people maintain transportation, get transportation, focus our resources on helping them get a job, um, secure a job, start a new career. You know, many times um, Project Power participants maybe even have a past career that they're coming out of, but because the abuse um, was so serious and severe and life-altering, um, it's going to take them a while longer to get back, get back to where they were. Um, so Project Power really helps support those services and I think the, the key term that the, the, the program focuses on is barrier removal. Mm -hmm. Helping victims and, and survivors of domestic violence um, get rid of those barriers that can stand in their way. Maybe it is just a car. You know, as I explained to many of the audiences that we talked to about the importance of this program, maybe it's something as, as uh, uh, rudimentary as a tire. You know, somebody gets a flat tire, can't get to a job interview, can't drop their children off at daycare. Um, Project Power is there to provide the funding to get that fixed, you know, be there for them so mm -hmm. they get a new tire or they've got reliable transportation. Um, those are the barriers that so often can, uh, can be the, dis the deciding factor in whether a person needs to go back to an abusive situation because of, you know, economic reliance on that abuser or ventures down the path of independence. And it's so key. It's so pivotal. Pivotal. And I think when people who support Project Power realize that it can come down to something as simple as a tire, yeah. um, or providing reliable care for children, you know, making sure that that's there on a daily basis, they suddenly see, okay, I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I, I really can make a difference in somebody's life. So this program has been very innovative, you know. And with Advocap, there, um, an incredibly important community agency too, to help you know with job uh, skills. Um, uh, I I obtaining and retaining employment, those kinds of things. It's, it's, it's been a very valuable program. Sure. Now, POWER is all in caps. Is it an acronym for something yeah, else? Yeah. Um, you know what? You had to ask me that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it right in front of me. Um, you know, I, what ultimately, ultimately, it's about POWER. It gets sure. back to the POWER thing, and that's really what it is. You know, it is project POWER. It is focusing on that POWER and reestablishing it in a survivor of domestic violence. Okay. So well, I'll get you an answer on that. We'll though. cut you a little slack for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you come on, though, I want to know. That's fair. <laughs> um, so, so is this a, a program then, Alex, just for people who are um, already being assisted by the Christine Ann Center? Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody who is in an abusive situation, mm -hmm. for example, who, who has not relied upon you folks in the past, can't just call and say, you know, I'm in an abusive situation, I've got a flat tire and I need to get to a job sure, interview. Sure, sure. I mean, yeah. so it's, it's for people already involved in the program. Yeah, I mean, we're making, we're, we're really establishing connections with our staff and through Advocap as well, and, you know, seeing if people qualify and if they, if they are the right fit for it. Um, last year in 2008, we had uh, 82 total participants were served. Um, that was included 32 new enrollments and uh, 42 people completed the program. Okay. So, you know, they were, the first step was contacting us, um, working with our advocates who are extremely amazing people, mm -hmm. um, really there, you know, side by side working with people to make sure that they're getting the support, they're getting, you know, even the, the supplies uh, necessary to help sustain them as they're concentrating okay. on job skills and concentrating on, you know, the transportation, getting to work, making sure that it's working out. Sure. Um, so um, that's the real first step is making those connections with people and okay. then, you know, we can establish that regular relationship. Okay. So, so uh, someone who, uh, let's just clarify, mm -hmm. is staying at Christine Ann Center mm -hmm. and having some services provided to them. Sure. They're not automatically part of Project Power, correct? Or no, are it, they? it's not an automatic. It's not, you know, okay. <clears throat> there, there's a lot of these programs that we offer and there are many programs we offer. Uh, where um, our advocates will work with our clients and, you know, talk with them and try to figure out what works best, uh, what works best for them. Um, would they be a great candidate for this program? 
Um, and they'll determine that. They'll go through the process. They'll go through some questions to kind of decide, you know, un understand a little bit about their life, um, do kind of an assessment, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, they'll figure it out and work together. Uh, so it, it's really a, a hand in hand kind of decision making process to see if it works out. So, what kinds of things qualify someone for being part of the program? Um, you know, because it, it's uh, advocates of partners, so income um, level is is a, is, a, is a big one, and um, um, you know the need for a, a steady job, um, that kind of thing. Uh, like we said before, transportation issues. Some of the barrier removal um, issues that mm -hmm. come up are transportation, housing assistance, um, you know, clothing and supplies. Those are some things that are su we support. Um, and then utilities, you know, so we, we're working with external clients there are other people out there who need assistance at, sure. at, uh, out there in the community to just maintain yeah. um, those kinds of things come into play. So. Besides AdvoCAP, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the churches you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other agencies that you all work with as far as this particular project goes? Um, I believe uh, the Women's Fund from uh, the Community Foundation, the Oshkosh Area Community Foundation, has okay. been a, an important uh, supporter of us. And gosh, there are just there are oodles of other uh, people out there and you know, individual supporters too. Sure. One thing that is very um, interesting about this program is <clears throat> getting back to the tire analogy. I guess it's really one of those rubber meets the road kind of programs mm -hmm. and people often are looking for that when they want to help in the community and I think they look at Project Power and see something that you know is making a difference um, uh, in a very uh, strategic way for people mm -hmm. you know there are people who fund all of our services and when they donate to Christine Ann and, and support us you know they understand we're doing good work but then there are people too who who really want to focus in and zoom in on a program that really is addressing key needs for people mm -hmm. and not maybe just the emergency shelter which is again a lot of times the first safe step sure. but a program that's continuing that journey and this is one of them and um, so th y there's there's supporters all over the map yeah. individuals organizations like women's fund uh, you know, giving circles uh, it's sure. it's pretty remarkable well, we're going to talk a little bit more um, in, in just a few minutes about the, the fundraising and mm -hmm. funding and, and giving and that kind of thing. But, you know, just from a general standpoint, you know, like you said, some just give in a general sense. Yeah. Others do want to remain a little bit more focused on, right. on their giving. What is more important, and, and not to slight either one, sure. but what is more important um, as an organization? Um, something that is more general, where someone just says, you know, here's a donation, use it wherever you can, right. or something that is really specific? Well, the easy answer <coughs> is we've got to have them all. Right. Um, right. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I mean, it's really true. I, and I'll give you another category, another layer to, d to think about. You know, we have people who call us up at Christine Ann uh, and say, hey, I'm coming by today. And I'm going to be dropping off some stuff because at our website, www.christineann.net, um, we have a shelter needs list where people can actually sign up for a, uh, a regular monthly list of what we need. Everything from shampoo to diapers to, um, you know, uh, uh, non-perishable food items. There are people who come by and, like today, I just met a gentleman who pulled up his car and dropped off a carload full of brand new purchased items from peanut butter I saw on there to mm. pens to uh, shampoo product, you know, healthcare products, sanitary products, that kind of stuff. Um, that's vital. Yeah. It is vital. We are really running what is essentially a, a large house or c small community. Mm -hmm. And um, that stuff, you know, the funding donations with help, which help support our programs and staff and what the work that they do. And um, just general donations of, you know, to, to, to funnel into programs like power. Um, uh, we have, you know, programs including male offender programs. Um, it's 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 really uh, important on all levels. Sure, sure. And I don't think a lot of people realize all the things that we do do beyond just you know keep that shelter going and healthy and vibrant mm -hmm. uh, in the community. There's a lot of things that we we really rely on support from the community for. Well, and and one of those things too is. Um, you know, working with the Oshkosh Area Humane Society. Right, yeah. You know, because yeah. usually when family pets are abused, there's someone in the family yeah. who's being abused as yeah. well and vice versa. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are fearful for their pets being left behind in an abusive situation. It's, and, yeah. you know, in the last maybe nine months to a year, we've seen so many incidents right. in the paper where, you know, people have 
taken right. out their aggression and their anger on family pets. Right. Often abusers, um, it, it's, it's a sad part of it, you know, often abusers will focus on a family pet because as we all know, if you have pets out there, mm -hmm. they are your family. Yep. You love them yep. uh, as you would anyone else in your family. And abusers will focus in on those pets and um, abuse them mm -hmm. to sometimes even make you know a, a human being come back. Sure. And you know because they're concerned about the, the care of the pet. That's the sad part of the story. The uplifting part of the story, which there are so many uplifting parts yeah. about what we do there, is the Oshkosh Area Humane Society is a huge supporter and collaborator with us, and they will. Um, uh, keep pets, uh, you know, at their humane society and make sure that people who are staying in shelter still have access and can go see those pets. You know, that's just one of the things that they'll do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's incredibly important, yeah. you know, because nobody wants to be thinking about what's happening to my dog yeah. or my cat or right. my parakeet. I don't know. My rabbit. My whatever. rabbit. <laughs> you could go on. Yeah. It's yeah. really, really uplifting and so important for people to... Uh, to maintain and focus on the things that they need to do for themselves to um, get that power back that we sure. talked about. Um, the website again, because you said dot mm -hmm. net, uh, it's Christine Ann dot, dot net. net. Yes, and www. Ann, it has an E or does not have an E? No E. No E on the end. Christine Ann dot net. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, very good. Now let's, since we were kind of talking about, um, you know, the uh, power uh, project power mm -hmm. first. Um, if people want more information about that, Alex, yeah, they can find that on the website as well. Yeah, we've got a, a kind of a preliminary listing and explanation of our programs and the things we do on our website. Also, you know, people are always free to call our main number and. Um, <clears throat> it's our 24-hour, 24-7 uh, help hotline, but it's also our main number, and that is 235-5998. And um, ask about it. Um, we can always, we're always directing people to the right advocates and people, members of our staff, to learn more about programs, to uh, figure out if, you know, maybe they can make, make a connection. Okay. and um, see how it could work for them. All right, good. Yeah. Well, we were also talking about uh, donations and so forth, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, you know, is, is there something that maybe you guys don't take? For example, I know that Goodwill, uh, over the years, yeah. has gotten very particular about what they will and will not take, right. and I'm sure that they have reasons for that, um, but I know it's created some disgruntled people in the community because they go down there <laughs> with a carload of stuff, sure. and, you know, Goodwill is like, well, <laughs> we'll take this, and we're not going to take that. Um, and again, there's probably good reasons why they're doing that, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. are there things that you prefer not to have or that you absolutely will decline? Um, you know, offhand, you know, we don't have a list of like red flag no-nos. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are things that we prefer and we, we, we often uh, encourage people to bring in gently or unused items. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to things like shampoo and personal care products, what we really would like is people to bring us, you know, new stuff, unused right. stuff, unopened. Um, th I think the people that are in shelter deserve that, and um, it's it's only fair and right. Well, it's um, only sanitary, too. And sanitary. <laughs> There's that, too. Um, but, you know, you mentioned Goodwill. Uh, just a, a point here. Goodwill is actually one of our great partners. And what we'll do is often when people will bring us clothing donations or call us first, which is a key, I think, a key tip, um, give us a call first if you have a question about whether or not we'll take something like a large piece of furniture. Um, we will often refer people to Goodwill uh, to donate because Goodwill is a partner with us and because they're better equipped to house a lot of clothing donations mm -hmm. and process that stuff, and we, don't we only have limited space at our shelter, um, they will allow our clients to access um, uh, for free, uh, kind of on a limited basis, I think, to access their donations and use them for job interviews or, mm -hmm. you know, professional clothing, that kind of thing. Okay. That's a real great partnership. And I think a lot of agencies like ours in the Fox Valley have those kinds of relationships mm -hmm. with, with organizations. Yeah. So. Well, one thing <coughs> I, I, I just recently did an article on um, recycling for businesses mm -hmm. and, you know, making your business more green and so forth. And, and the uh, subject of donating to nonprofits uh, came up. Yeah. And, um, you know, what I was told by, by the people I was talking to is you should call. Yeah. Um, and find out if if a nonprofit wants a certain item because if it's a certain item that they then have that they can't use, then they have to in turn either find a place to donate it to or they have to pay right. to recycle it. Right. Um, depending on what it is. In this particular case, it was office equipment and right. electronics and things like that. Um, so you know, it is a good idea to to call ahead if you're even if you're not maybe in doubt, just call ahead and yeah. ask. 
I think that's smart. And yeah. and again, for us to, um, you know, and I'm sure other or <coughs> nonprofit organizations, if we don't have the space to store it, we have to look to see where we can put it then. Sure. And so it's, uh, it, does it still enter the waste stream? You know, we're going to do our part to make sure it doesn't either, but ultimately maybe that's where it could go. Yeah. Um, I know right now, for example, we've got a volunteer uh, who's working on proper disposal of medications, mm -hmm. you know, because we have many of those in shelter too, sure. whether it's aspirin or just, you know, basic over-the-counter stuff. Yeah. That has to be properly disposed of. Um, we still ta accept a lot of donations because we need a lot of that stuff uh, just to help, you know, support kids and, and moms who are staying with us. Sure. But what do you do when you can't use it yeah. or when it expires? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, give us a call. That's always the best advice. And um, again, really, really great staff who always know exactly what we need, um, what we can do, where we can store it, how we can keep it um, uh, fresh and, and, uh, and uh, quality for a long time. Sure. So. Well, speaking of calling, what about um, donations of cell phones? I know that mm -hmm. some time ago um, I took some unused cell phones down to Christine Ann Center. Yeah. And um, they're important, at least I was told back yeah. then, uh, because even if there's not active service on the line, the 911 feature, and I don't know that a lot of people know this, the 911 feature on any cell phone still works, yep. uh, even if there's not active service on that line. Yeah. And that's what you guys use yeah. them for, I'm assuming, yeah. is for emergency situations? Absolutely. In fact, a great story here. Um, we do collect them. And uh, I, one of my first few days there, <clears throat> I was um, working the phones. We all work the phones and help people uh, when they call. And uh, one of our, uh, our great shelter advocates was <laughs> plugging stuff in under my desk here and there and everywhere. <laughs> and we had power cords going this way and that way. And uh, we were juicing up phones because you got to have them ready for people. Yeah. It's a valuable resource. So when people donate that 911 phone, as we call it, um, what it is is ultimately a, an amazing tool. Somebody who may be, you know, still um, needing to get home and is concerned about whether or not that abuser is going to be there or not be there, um, or whether you know there needs to be you know a custody issue, a transfer of children, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that there's a safety plan in place, that there's a safe outlet, and there's communication. So the 911 phones are vital. That's what's that's what they're doing. And there's a lot of shelters too I know out there and organizations who are now recycling them too because of the metal components. Sure. And they've been valuable, but. Um, you know, strategically and most importantly, that 911 uh, communication is, is vital. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. All right. Anything else on um, either, um, you know, project power or uh, donations that we need to talk about here? No. Um, you know, again, I'm glad we brought this up. You know, always give us a call. That's, I think, the best advice when you want to make a donation. We do get a lot of calls from people who want to know, would you take this? Would you take that? And often the answer is yes. Okay. Um, but we, it's good to know when it's coming, too, yeah, so we've got right. staff on hand to <laughs> offload. <Obviously>, yep. <laughs> All right, good. Well, let's talk about a couple of the other things. Sure. Obviously, you know, you are a nonprofit. Fundraising is a huge part of that. Big time. Whether it's donations of, of goods and, and materials or it's, uh, you know, monetary donations. And one of the big fundraisers that you guys have had for a number of years is Men Who Cook. Yeah. And that's coming up fairly coming soon, up quick. isn't it? Yeah, it's a Saturday, June 27th. Okay. Uh, and it'll be at Reeve Memorial Union uh, okay. right on the UW Oshkosh campus and uh, it's going to be great this year. This is our ninth annual Men Who Cook and uh, we will be having, boy is it more than 50 chefs this year? Wow. Uh, this year also focusing on an international theme which is great. Uh, kind of to focus in on the, the diversity of our community and of our cooks and of the recipes that they feature. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an amazing event you know and it always has been. The concept is brilliant I think as a man who cooks. <laughs> uh, I won't be cooking that night. I'll be helping out but um, it's great, you know, there, there's, there's a need to get guys to, I think, and, and a lot of uh, men in the Fox Valley region think, step up, um, go on the record, be seen, be heard, that they uh, support what we do, that they do not agree and will not condone domestic violence and domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And um, this is one way to show that, sure. you know, and um, it's great. I think the community really responds and we've had as many people who maybe are watching this show know if they go, amazing food, uh, real fun. You know, the guys who do it are just great. Um, I've had a chance to be back in the kitchen when they're preparing their stuff, and it's a riot. And they're very serious. They are very serious when they're making their dishes. You know, I had a gentleman there last year who was making raspberry venison something or other, and <laughs> I, my wife and I were washing dishes to help out with the event, and we were just stunned at the diversity of food. Uh, it was great, and um, it's always a good time. 
and the community response is sure. remarkable. Are there any vegan dishes for uh, vegetarians? Mm, good question. I think there usually are. That's some the in second there. one I've stumped you on tonight. Alan. Yeah. That's not my goal, though. Mm. <laughs> That's a good question, though. I, I think there are, okay. um, just because there's always guys that are doing more um, uh, or derby kinds of things. Sure. That's kind of what they're sure. concentrating on. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's meatless foods, meatless okay. dishes. In All there, right. So. Uh, for viewers who, who may be new to the area mm -hmm. and not know what Men Who Cook is, yeah. why don't you just tell us sure. briefly what it is? Uh, Men Who Cook is, uh, again, it's our, it's our largest fundraiser of the year for Christine Ann Domestic Abuse Services. And um, what we do is we go out there and recruit and rely on uh, uh, a cadre of volunteer chefs who are men to uh, step up with their best recipes and literally spend a weekend preparing them in a you know, good, safe, clean environment at the UW Oshkosh. Bless UW Oshkosh for hosting. Yep. And make their food and help um, sell. In, in doing that, we sell tickets. The ticket proceeds go to help sustain Christine and Domestic Abuse Services and all the programs and, and, uh, and uh, resources that we offer. And it's great. You know? How much are the tickets? This year, uh, this year I believe, uh, let's see, tickets are $35. Uh, we have it on our website, uh, too. On the website. That's okay. the best resource, christineann.net. Um, 35 and 75 I think, maybe for uh, tables and for individuals. Double check that, okay. though, for me. All right. um, and is that um, tax deductible? Because they're they're getting a meal, so I'm not sure if that would be tax, de tax deductible, deductible or not. deductible. Good question. <laughs> okay, that's the All right, third number one. Number three. Strike three. <laughs> Um, maybe so, and, yeah. And possibly, or maybe a portion of it, who yeah, knows. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that's, that's coming up, um, Christine Ann's anniversary yeah. is coming up yeah. uh, in September? September uh, 16th, I believe, is the actual 25th anniversary of the day that we opened our doors uh, in a little space at Parkview Health Center, uh, the old Parkview Health Center in Winnebago County owned. And um, it's remarkable to think that it's been 25 years that we've been doing this and um, expanding, growing, evolving, mm -hmm. uh, making so many connections and collaborations with the community over those years. But we will be recognizing that. Uh, we will hope to have people who even remember Christine Ann uh, come back, maybe share some thoughts. Sure. And um, um, yeah, it's, it's really been a, a year of reflection for us, but also a year of rededication to our efforts sure. and making sure that we are getting out there in the community and the community understands um, what I think is a real valuable uh, asset and resource to have just down the street here. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's probably a bittersweet celebration, too. It is. Because, you know, it's 25 years of, of helping women and men who are in abusive situations, and mm -hmm. yet you would think uh, with all of the media attention and all of the education and awareness that's being done uh, about this issue, yeah. and yet it's a growing issue. It is. I you think know. what what needs to be understood is what we kind of started out with talking about tonight. This is a community issue, mm -hmm. and I also don't think it. You know, people I think often view it as, uh, for lack of a better term, a downer, mm -hmm. uh, depressing, sad. And for the victims and survivors of domestic violence, you know, it's a, it's challenging. It's emotionally uh, there. It's 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 debilitating, but. What we as a community can realize is it's also a very uplifting story. Mm -hmm. This is a story about uh, survivors who are regaining that power and they need the community to rally around them and support sure. them and sustain them. And part of my job, uh, especially this year before, you know, as we continue on is I really want to get out there to those workplaces, to those churches, uh, to you know, the schools we are excellent in. But I think there's a lot of people who can open their doors to us sure. to start a conversation about this. What can we tell their employees to help them help others when they see the red flags and signs of abuse? Maybe then, maybe then we can really make a difference um, and stop this from happening. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, before we go, just mm -hmm. real quickly, did you guys get any stimulus money? You know, we are watching it very closely. It, we have so many different federal resources and funding sources that there's, there's lots of different uh, uh, avenues. Um, there's, you know, federal law that's been in existence for several years that will be an avenue for us to okay. get uh, some funding for programs. Um, Project Power, you know, that's a federally supported program too. There might be some avenues there. So, you know, working with agencies like Advocap and keeping our eyes open too and working with our legislators, we're keeping a close eye. There are ways, but um, we're still going to rely on our communities to really support right. us here. Excellent. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you we for having us. We appreciate it, and we'd love to have you back in the future. Um, and speaking of legislators, when we come back in uh, the future, two minutes from now, uh, we'll be joined by our own uh, local legislator, uh, Representative Gordon Hintz. We'll be right back. Dear Mom and Dad, well, I finally have some time off, so I'm writing to tell you that I'm doing well. We have good days and bad days over here. We try to remember the good ones and get through the bad ones. Mostly we have each other, and that's what keeps us going. And Mom, since you asked, if anyone wants to help, just tell them to contact the USO. You can't believe how much they do for us. With love, your son, Michael. Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. We were in an emergency situation. We don't have extra. We have a little bit of water and a little bit of food. A meeting no. place, no. No. I don't think we have a first aid kit. We have tuna fish, we have right. beans, we tuna. have um, um, canned beans. tomatoes, true. you know. That's true, but uh, that's really not survival food. Tomato we, paste. Yeah, well, oh. yeah. Right? They caught part of that, I think. Right. Anyway, welcome, Gordon. We appreciate it very much. Um, during the break, we were talking a little bit about the budget, and you've just come from some um, several hours, I guess, of um, discussion on that very issue. And uh, just to kind of bring people up to date, in case they're not aware, um, the um, the state's $63 million budget has already passed the um, legislature's budget committee. It's on its way to the assembly, um, where it could be, um, I read, to be debated on as early as June 9th, and then if it passes there and uh, the Senate, it goes on to Governor Doyle for his, um, for his signature. Um, you know, we seem to be moving forward a little bit more smoothly so far this time around than two years ago, but there's still a ways to go here, isn't there? There is. Um, I think one of the things we wanted to be able to do in this session was get the budget done on time. I think that was the one thing that stood out. Uh, people are never going to agree on everything, but we were kind of stood out from the rest of the country and that I think we were the last state to pass the budget yeah. several months late. Um, and so, you know, obviously it's a miserable time. The economy sort of wreaked havoc on state revenues throughout the country. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, even with uh, Democrats in control, the Senate, the Assembly, and the governors, uh, the majorities are pretty tight. Uh, Wisconsin's a diverse state. We've got, you know, urban, rural, manufacturing, you know, research, university, and, um, you know, getting this thing through, uh, people are, you know, pushing for, um, some changes, amendments, um, you know, in, in, in the best interest or what they feel is in the best interest, but um, coming up with a compromise, I think, you know, we hopefully will be done by the end of the month, but uh, it'll be a busy few weeks here. Sure. Well, on the Joint Finance Committee, all 12 Democrats voted for it. Um, four Republicans, all four Republicans opposed it. So right along party lines, basically. Um, you know, what were the major sticking points that you heard from from the Republicans. Sure, I mean, as someone who you know, I'm glad I almost had those two years in the minority just to sort of um, you know be a, you know part of the process. But you have a different role and responsibility. Um, we certainly would like as much support as we could get from the other side. Um, but the you know the budget one's tough, especially in a year like this. You're going to end up voting for some things that you may not. Um, ultimately like, uh, but, you know, the legislative process is about deliberation and compromise, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you can't just stand on your uh, purity stool <laughs> and ask for the perfect thing. Um, 
you know, in a year like this, when we're making more cuts than we ever have in our state's history, um, that are going to have an impact on services. Uh, you know, if you don't have to vote yes, you're not going to, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on us to, um, you know, come up with the votes to pass it. So, uh, you know, there were some things I think that were changed during finance that, you know, may have had, you know, slightly different uh, lineups than 12-4, but, um, you know, the if you don't have to vote for cuts, a lot of them weren't going to do that. Yeah. Did, did they have something in particular that the Republicans were were really kind of adamant against um, or not? Um, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, that's just the thing. I mean, no one likes, uh, you know, additional fees or additional revenues, and mm -hmm. no one likes to cut things that may have an impact on schools or city sure. services. Um, but we didn't see a lot of alternatives. I mean, that's just the thing. A lot of times we see the uh, minority party will put forward, well, here's what we think we should cut, or here's how he, we mm -hmm. would do it. Uh, we didn't see a lot of proposals, and I guess that's sort of made it more rhetorical politics, a lot of sound bites, you know, oh, look, they're raising taxes or they're cutting schools, you know, whatever it is, it seems to be. And I understand. I mean, it's, it's politics, but yeah. it's not always that productive. Yeah. Well, just before I came over here today, um, I, I saw something from the Associated Press where um, there's some fracturing even within the uh, the Democratic Party now uh, concerning the budget. Uh, it, it, Democrats are questioning a new 75 percent phone fee, um, requiring police to collect racial profiling data, changes to state liability laws. Um, it says they also raise concerns about forcing insurance companies to cover autism consolidating attorneys from some state agencies into the Department of Administration. Um, you know, I mean... If Sounds you a lot could, like my afternoon. <laughs> if you could gaze into your crystal ball, how would you say this is going to play out? Well, I mean, I think those were some of the hot-button issues where there is a lot of disagreement, not just among Republicans and Democrats, but, you know, certainly between Democrats, um, you know, certain members... Uh, you know, Representative Cullen is chair of the insurance committee, has very, you know, specific feelings and experience on things, you know, um, was probably not happy that that was included in the budget. And I think there will be a, an amendment and there will be some discussion on, on those things. You know, the other policy items, uh, you know, a lot of us would probably just say it'd be easier to, to pull them out. You know, you're trying to push to get the votes to do that. Um, but again, it's a, uh, a complicated process where you have to arrive at 50 votes, mm -hmm. and uh, we're trying to improve it as much as possible. There are probably a lot of phone calls over the weekend trying to, you know, build support for things. So I think some people were kind of drawing their line in the sand and letting it be known where they do stand. Well, with all of the, uh, you know, all of the focus, um, both locally and in, you know, statewide and, and even um, on a national basis on, on talk shows and things like that on autism, mm -hmm. uh, why would someone be opposed to covering autism? Um, you know, actually, and I was just talking to a colleague about that on the way home, you only have to have a you know, meeting with the family who's going through the yeah. challenges, um, and we knew, do know that the early intervention is what is going to save money in the long mm -hmm. run and is proven effective in helping a child grow up, um, you know, with the least, uh, um, you know, challenges. Um, I guess, you know, I think that some of it was about the exact bill, um, uh, you know, that it didn't have a chance to maybe be tweaked a little bit, and they may be proposing, you know, those tweaks. But this is something that we've been debating for a couple of years now. Um, you're right, there is rising research and, and data. I don't think there's anybody that's uh, opposed to, um, you know, I, well, I hope they're not opposed to additional coverage, but, you know, the process is probably some of the opposition. What are some of the highlights, Gordon, um, to the bill as it's proposed right now, the budget bill? Highlights, well, um, I mean, look, you know, we had a couple bit basic principles that we wanted to do. Um, you know, you want to be able to uh, maintain core services, mm -hmm. public safety, sure. aid, aid for cities. I think at the beginning of the budget, some folks were worrying that we'd see a 10% cut to shared revenue. Um, in the end, we had the 2.5% cut uh, towards the end. Um, we've tried to, you know, the 75 cent uh, wireless fee is trying to dedicate more money to local law enforcement to make sure that, you know, that's not what, what is getting cut. Um, you know, we did have to cut from K-12 education, but not as much as, again, once was thought. And, you know, that's not just, you know, maintaining our commitment to good schools, but it also has an impact on property taxes. So, you know, we didn't want to just pass the buck entirely to local government, although I think they will still face tough challenges. Um, you know, the universities came out cut, but much better than they did in 2003. I mean, it's mm -hmm. hard, and everybody's, got, everybody's received cuts. 
Um, but we also turned the corner and we're doing some smarter things. Uh, corrections, for instance, I think it's highlighted the fact that it would cost us two and a half billion dollars more over the next 10 years if we did nothing um, to our correction system. We've done this, you know, put the earned release program in where we're going to put some incentive for better behavior, uh, let out some nonviolent um, inmates so they can, you know, stand a better chance at reintegration and save $27 million. I mean, it's a start. Uh, we haven't done everything we needed to do, but you really want to use fiscal challenges like this as an opportunity to ask yourself, you know, what can we no longer, um, you know, be able to do? Um, you know, the other parts are a lot of the federal stimulus money that we got for capital projects has allowed us to move forward, um, you know, construction on Highway 41 um, and other, a number of the other things that are going to help uh, construction development happen when, you know, the private sector is dried up more. So. Yeah. Uh, this isn't one of those, you know, I don't think anybody's, uh, this is, it's, a, it's pretty bad. I mean, it mm -hmm. hasn't been a whole lot of fun. You know, we're elected to govern, but it's been a lot of grading over, it's sort of like I say, you know, there's a series of really bad dishes in front of me and I have to eat three of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good analogy. I, I kind of like that. Um, well, we've talked about cuts to agencies and governments and schools. Um, I guess we're going to have to wait and see how this all pans out. You know, um, Department of Justice officials are saying that um, you know the Joint Finance Committee has has cut their budget so deep that they're fearing it'll cripple their agency. Um, what are, you know? In fact, they're they're complaining that this is political payback. Yeah, uh, and you I, know, uh, um, you know, the last action that was taken by finance, uh, you know, took a cut out of their budget to give additional pay to assistant DAs and public defenders because we were seeing an erosion in the numbers and people that were leaving in those positions. Um, we're kind of trying to, rec you know, reconcile some of the numbers they're putting out there. I mean, we've asked state employees, including those at DOJ, to take a. Uh, furlough um, to not accept the 2% pay increase that was scheduled. They have factored those cu reduction amounts into that $13 million number, which is a little, um, I think, disingenuous given that that's not actually impacting um, the service reductions. But look, I mean, I just, you know, you asked me for highlights and I told you all these great things that were only cutting, you know, so much. I mean, it's, uh, you want to maintain core service, but we've asked everybody to step up and, you know, we're going to look at some of those challenges that the Attorney General's put forward and, you know, everything that we've decided that may or may not be amended has to be revenue neutral. If we're going to restore that money, you know, it's got to come from somewhere or it's going to have an additional, you know, revenue. Um, it's just that, you know, we didn't really spare anybody. I mean, everybody was asked to, to step forward and, um, you know, propose some cuts. And, you know, you hope that we can do this without having to put, whether you're cutting spending or increasing taxes, um, you're taking money out of the economy. And uh, you want to be careful about, sure. you know, which ones you do. So Well, you mentioned the furloughs. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the furloughs. Yeah. And I think a lot of misunderstanding about it too, and probably in part because there's some misinformation out there. Can you just kind of explain or try? I can try. <laughs> how, the, how the furloughs really are going to work and who's affected by them? Because that's where one of the, I think, yeah. misunderstandings and is. And I think some in. of this is still being worked out. I mean, look, we are, you know, if you look at what some of the other states are going through, I mean, they've made even, you know, have been in worse p positions mm -hmm. and made even, you know, bigger. I think more threatening decisions, uh, but some have done furloughs. We, uh, you know, the governor who has the right has, you know, asked and it was uh, voted on by leadership to ask everybody to take a furlough. Um, you know, I think there are some details to be worked out. For me, you know, people that are frontline security, for instance, at our prison who work 24 hours, sh you know, that have uh, three eight hour shifts, it doesn't make sense if to furlough them if you have to replace them with an overtime employee, and mm -hmm. that goes with any um, acute care or where there's a, a security staffing ratio position. Um, you know, but I think what they also said was, well, then you're going to ask certain state employees to effectively take a 16-day cut and some not to. So I think we're still kind of balancing, well, you know, how are you ultimately going to do this? Um, the other concern is, you know, with UW faculty, they're asking them to take a furlough, but they get paid on a nine-month cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so the percentage, it turns out to be different than it would, um, you know, for other employees. And, you know, in our cases, you know, we were told, you know, we couldn't take a furlough because, you know, and so we're finding out how we how we return the amount of money that it would lead up to, but we've already paid taxes on it, so it's kind of this complicated <laughs> formula that we're trying to figure out. So, 
I would say we were given a list of parameters. I've been in touch with a lot of our state employees, and we do have a lot in our district on trying to answer questions for them and find out what I can. Um, you know, but if the goal is to save money, it certainly doesn't make sense to furlough people that are going to be replaced with overtime. Right, right. But the unions are really, um, you know, for all the good that unions have done over the years in, in many respects, they are really digging their heels in on this, aren't they? It's, you know, I mean, I can tell you as a technically a public employee and elected official in times like these, when you see what's happening to the economy and the job layoffs and the job loss, um, you know, you always feel a little bit more resentment. I mean, teachers mm -hmm. will report that, city employees, um, you know, they just don't want to feel, I think, like the budget is being, you know, balanced on, you know, their backs. And of course, so when people sometimes say, you know, they need to take a cut or they need to pay more into their retirement, um, you know, I just remind them that, you know, when the economy takes off again, are they going to also say that they should share in those gains? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're trying to, I think, deal with them in good faith um, and help, you know, take ideas from them directly on how to be part of the solution. I think they automatically are not receiving their increases, but, um, you know, it's a balancing act. And, you know, I think all public employees are probably going to have to choose, you know, at some point between, um, you know, layoffs and a reduction in service or, you know, maintaining pay and benefits. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, you know, that's the kind of squeeze that the state is in and ultimately you'll see local governments struggling with those same things. Well, and, you know, and, and the unions, they, they have to understand, uh, you know, it, nobody wants to balance a budget on anybody's back. Right. You know, I think we can all agree to that. But, you know, everybody in the private sector is taking pay cuts, being asked to take time off unpaid. Uh, I, this is not something brand new you know it's not something that's just being done to target union workers this since the economy has started to tank this has been happening more and more frequently in the private sector and they're not certainly they're not blind to that fact you wouldn't think anyway but all of a sudden you hear the unions oh poor me you know it's uh, and we should also I mean this is we haven't seen an economic time like this in 75 years no. I mean this is an incredible challenge and um, you know, one of the things we see is unlike the private sector, you know, we have more demand now than we've ever had for government services, for mm -hmm. job training, for unemployment, for health insurance, for, for public safety. You know, you have more right. people engaging in riskier behavior. And at the same time, we have less money to pay for the kind of services and resources that help in that time. Um, you know, and, the, and, and unions are kind of stuck in the middle um, because they have to deal with, um, you know, wanting to make sure that they are, you know, fairly treated and are a part of the process. Um, but again, they're going to be faced with some decisions just because, you know, the revenue is really dictating what we can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're fighting less about, you know, dollars. There's less to argue about right now because there's less money. I think yeah. everybody, there's only so much you can do. And, and I think it's going to trickle down, unfortunately, to, to, to schools and cities. But, you know, you're correct that I think when people look around, uh, a lot of people are just happy to be, you know, be to pay, pay the bills and have a job right now. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, um, we're not going to solve the budget problem here, so let's move on to, uh, <laughs> to a, a bill that you have um, actually brought forward. And it's cracking down on payday lending. And, and this just uh, made news in the last week. Um, for those viewers who may not know what payday lending is. Yeah, Let's um, talk about it. you know, and our bill covers, uh, you know, uh, payday loans, um, checks cashed places, um, auto title loans, but a situation where someone would uh, be in a situation where they would need a short term loan. Um, let's say you take out a $300 loan, you'd have to pay an average of $360 back in two weeks. Um, and, you know, your car breaks down, you have a medical bill, you have something to pay. Um, you know, it's there's people that you know may not have the best credit that you know find this to be a viable option. Um, the problem is there's no consideration really on their ability to pay that loan back, um, and the business model is kind of predicated that they won't pay it back, mm -hmm. and then they'll have to roll it over and or take out a loan from the lender who's right next door. I mean, I think on Witzel and Kohler uh, we have something like seven. Um, lenders within a block. So you could always just walk to the other one and that it kind of speaks to that issue. But in the last two years, I've had a handful of people that have contacted my office, often through a third party that said, you know, I've taken out money, I've fallen into the debt trap, I'm now thousands of dollars in the hole and I'm just paying off the interest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 30 years ago, this type of, you know, situation was illegal. Yeah. Uh, we've seen an erosion of the usury laws. Um, 
and this business model essentially preying upon people in a desperate situation who even if you know the, it's there in the terms of it don't really understand or think that they can pay it off and don't um, and you're really eroding the wages and benefits of people that are in this position um, you know this bill is not going to solve the challenges of getting the unbanked or people that have challenging credit um, getting that but I don't think we should accept you know six seven eight hundred percent that we see and people falling into the debt trap where you know government ultimately has to provide services to repair um, the devastation and you know in Wisconsin we've really gone unregulated uh, we've been in a, sort of a gold mine for the industry mm -hmm. uh, other states have taken action even if they haven't gone with you know really strong reforms but Fifteen states have done the bill that we're proposing. Uh, the president has put it as uh, the same bill as part of his national effort to strengthen families and the economy. Um, and it's the same law that is on the books for military service members and their families when it sh was demonstrated that they were being targeted um, you know, by these lenders and that they were falling into the debt trap and it was undermining security. So you know, at a time when we don't have a lot of money to do things in the budget, uh, you know, I think, well, how can we, you know, restore the wages or protect people, especially that may find themselves in a desperate, more desperate position now, um, and it's to have the conversation in Wisconsin and hopefully, you know, put these protections in and then, you know, help work with our local community um, credit unions and banks and, you know, I know we have a get checked program here in the local area mm -hmm. aimed at getting these people, you know, banked and, and starting a savings account and, and giving them options yeah. that that don't make them worse off. What would your bill do specifically, Gordon? It, um, it puts in the 36% annual percentage rate cap, which okay. still sounds high to a lot of people, but um, that cap has been what has shown to be um, prevent the debt trap from happening. Mm -hmm. That mirrors the legislation at the federal level okay. for military members. Okay. Well, it, I mean, they do seem to prey on, uh, well, they prey on anyone who walks through their doors, it seems. <laughs> but, um, you know, a number of years ago, I was um, doing an eviction um, of a tenant, and um, several cases were called before me, and uh, some of them were these types of places. And um, you know, it's where you had to put up your car title as yeah. collateral. You would not believe, within maybe a 45-minute period, um, how many repossessions I saw just going cars left and right going to the one place in particular and you know I, I mean here you are you're going to these places because you need a small loan immediately yeah. you have to put up your car for collateral right. and then you end up losing your car I mean that's just a horrible you're going from bad to worse almost and that's just it I mean whatever tough position a lot of people find them in, themselves in you know I hear story after story mm -hmm. the position they're in now is often worse than that original position and right. And the stories are heartbreaking, and yeah. oftentimes I hear about them after they're too late. But, you know, uh, most people don't, they drive by these places if they haven't experienced them. They don't think twice about it. It's not a first-tier issue. Um, you know, and the people sometimes that find themselves in this position aren't the people out there, you know, contacting their legislator to do anything. But the community advocates, the citizen groups, I mean, the mayor of Milwaukee has said, you know, they've had a moratorium there for four years, uh, zoning restrictions. Green yeah. Bay has a zoning restriction. Um, Superior has a zoning restriction where they don't allow any, you know, any more lenders to move to their community because, um, you know, they've seen the impact that it's had and they're trying to mm -hmm. use whatever tools they have. But those groups, those communities have said, you know, help us because they see the impact that it has. Yeah. Um, you know, on people, and uh, I've gotten a lot of support uh, since we kind of made a pretty big push out there. And um, but you know, we're going to have a big fight on this because uh, they have tremendous representation, and that's fair in our system. And they have deep yeah. pockets, and uh, we'll have to see. Well, you know, it might uh, be what you might be well advised to see what the other states have done <laughs> in order to, to crack down on these places. We have. We've because looked at the other states. It's only going to get worse, you know, with the economy the way it is and credit tightening, mm -hmm. even for people with the best of credit. Right. It's, it's tightening. I mean, credit card companies are, are cutting how much you can borrow uh, or charge on your credit cards, how much you can do as a cash advance. They're raising the interest rates on outstanding balances and future charges. Um, so credit is tightening up. 
and that's the challenge because a lot yeah. of those people may become candidates for exactly. these places yep. and while I don't want to take you know options away I don't want the only option them for them to be a situation where they tell themselves yeah I can pay this off and then they fall into the trap that's you know geared to pull them in right right um, our time's almost up but I want to talk real briefly about um, this also has made the news recently if I can find it ignition interlock um, there is a um, bill right now being sponsored or co-sponsored by uh, um, Dick Spanbauer from the mm -hmm. 53rd Assembly District to um, mandate that ignition interlocks be installed in, in the vehicles of uh, repeat drunken drivers. Mm -hmm. And uh, But now, you know, the, the scuttlebutt is that it may not be quite the deterrent that people thought it was. Do you have a, a thought on this, or have you had yeah, a chance to look into it Yeah, I'm actually on a comprehensive bill that also includes increasing that option. I mean, look, there's not a, a magic wand solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to educate, we need to culturally change the behavior and help the people that you know, may have a drug or alcohol addiction that are driving. Um, but even if we can reduce, even if it works for 20% of the people, or even if it reminds that person as they have someone else blow into it, that you know, I'm about to break the law. I'm about to risk my life and others. Um, you know, I think it can help be a part of a broader solution. Mm -hmm. I mean, for some people, it's going to be, you know, getting them into treatment. For some people, it's going to be additional penalties. For some people, it's going to be an initial interlock. But you know, we have to try. I think a comprehensive approach. Um, and that's you know, why that's a part of our bill. Um, states like New Mexico have shown some pretty decent. I think 20 to 25 percent reduction. Um, and the technology on these things is getting better. Uh, I know there was an article the other day that said, well, sometimes they're ignored or they drive another car, but you know, we ask for the person to pay for the cost of it, so um, you know, it's not doesn't always fall to government to pay for it, but um, you know, we can't just say, oh, that's not gonna work 100% of the time, we're not gonna do it. I mean, even if we save one or two or three or four sure. lives, uh, no one's gonna be able to put a cost on that saving. Well, exactly. So what's, what's, uh, what is the process? Where is this, uh, what's the timeline? I mean, this like has been, this? I mean, right now, it can, Ignition Interlock is an option. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we, the bill that I was more familiar with, uh, mandated it for second and third offenders that had a, a blood alcohol uh, count um, higher, you know, above a certain uh, level. Um, you know, this is the kind of initiative that I think could be effective and has legislative support. You know, we've struggled on whether to make first offense criminal. Um, the public has not been very warm to mandatory sobriety checkpoints. Um, so, I mean, we're trying to, we know we've got a problem. Um, I can, you know, it's hard because I don't think government can automatically end drunk driving, but it doesn't mean we don't try. And a lot of these comprehensive solutions we think are things that, you know, should have traction, especially with some of the high profile tragedies we've had. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, good. Well, um, so as far as the budget goes, let's go back to that for just a second. Yeah. Um, you guys are going to probably be debating the it. The Assembly's uh, going to take it up next week. Um, hopefully we will pass a version. The Senate's going to take it up. They may have some changes. There'll be a conference committee. This will be a this will be a grind. I mean, I you know I used to read about these kind of things, and um, I'm trying to take notes every day on just uh, how painful this is. But you know, we're doing what we can. Hopefully the economy will turn around, and and then we'll have some big decisions on how to structurally change. You know, I think some systematic problems, and you know, we're not going to be able to sustain what we do as a state sure. um, without revisiting a lot of the you know bigger things we've built into the budget. So, if all goes according to plan, when should we have a budget finalized? Uh, I'll call my shot right now and say <laughs> the Thursday, uh, the last Thursday in June. All right, late, well. maybe early Friday morning. Okay, good. Well, let's hope so. All right, Gordon, thanks for being here. We my appreciate pleasure. it. And thank, uh, thank you, thanks to the crew, and we'll see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh. <laughs>